talking about organizations adapting, what yes. are the, in your research and also your application and who you mm -hmm. study in the golf and tennis world, Sure. what are two or three of the most important things that you see? Because on your blog and on your website, you talk about finding a teacher that taught you naturally. Mm -hmm. What are the things that the characteristics that you have studied, learned, embodied, and said, these are the three most important things mm -hmm. for a coach? Yes. That parents can take, teachers can take, and, and such. Mm -hmm. The number one, um, when I talk about teaching naturally, um, I think that kind of goes back to, um, in loosely speaking, a conceptual model ac uh, on which I actually based my dissertation 20 years ago, which is actually Vincent Tinto's model of integration, academic and social integration. All right, tell me about that. Let, let's go. Sure. Cause I'm, I got my pen and paper out here and, sure. and I'm going to learn from you, doc. Here right. we go. So the, so the shorthand of, of this is essentially people succeed when coming into a learning environment when they're able to fully integrate. In an academic environment, you succeed if you're coming to a Michigan or an Alabama, whatever, whatever institution it is, when you feel like you, can, you belong, you can mm -hmm. compete there, you have the skill set to, 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 to pass yeah. classes, to, 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 to persist and, and, and ultimately graduate. The same way in a social in social integration, which is just as important. Yes, I may be a great golf. I mean, we've seen it, a great golfer, maybe a person on a on a golf team, but they just do not mesh with the culture and the and the energy, if you will, of that team of that school. Doesn't mean that they couldn't be a great rock star on that team. Doesn't mean that they couldn't you know do great things in the classroom. There, it's just not a fit for them. And that is social integration. Is, so, that up to, is, that up to, is that up to the institution? Or is it in, up to the individual stakeholders to do their job to integrate too? It's a two-way street. But for many years, and, and this is kind of where, where golf is not in, the yeah. institution and the institution didn't feel any responsibility to do that. They're like, you know, kind of like, well, you know, we're, you know, fill in the blank school or you're, you're you know, this organization, you should just be happy to be here. Yeah. And then in many ways, that's kind of how golf has been. Oh, uh, yeah, no doubt about that. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's not going to facilitate, in my home. Yeah, because I wonder, like, I wonder, thing. had, I wonder if I had gotten into golf, had I not learned to play on an Air Force base, hmm. you know, overseas, where the integration for the most part on that base was, hey, we're all overseas away from home. Mm -hmm. So it's a home away from home. Sure. And, and I know when I was there, my dad was an officer. So and I understand there was a split between officers, and non officers, sure. Sure. um, or enlisted in officers, but there was also, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not naive to that. Um, but I also know that the, you know, everybody, you know, like the bowling alley and the, all the facilities were, I mean, that's where you went because how you had nothing else to do there. Mm -hmm. It was boring. Right. It was, you know, spent two years there. It was boring. It was cool, but it was boring. Right, right. And so I felt comfortable as a junior to go out there and play because, hey, we, you know, there are so many people in the military learning to play golf because, hell, you got nothing else to yeah, do. Sure. So it was essentially the integration, your integration into it was, was not, was a non-issue. Yeah. Reverse that when you talk about a club environment. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean... And there are so many things that I, that I just see. I, a lot of times, I don't know if clubs even recognize the way. They don't. Uh, you know, like, okay, so why, why does the head pro never take the time to ever teach the, the women's clinic? Yeah. Isn't it funny? Somebody told me a while ago uh, doing this podcast that golf needs to follow the soccer model and outside the country, the football model, which mm -hmm. is the best instructors teach the beginners. Exactly. Not to, hey, you're the beginner group. Let's go to the beginning instructor. Right. Let's go to the instructor who just is trying to find their own rhetoric. They don't even right. know how to ask people's names. They exactly. are overwhelmed and scared. So we're going to send it to them, but I'm here to teach the elite player. Right, the elite player. And, and if you're, you're above a 10 handicap, then go to the back of the line. Yeah. Exactly. exactly. It's, it's, it's a model that is That's not how I felt. That's how I felt the day I learned to ski. Exactly. I, exactly. I mean, and as I mentioned, I, um, I've mentioned and people that know me know this. I was a right handed golfer for, from the time I was a child. And one day I literally woke up and my right hand wasn't working anymore. It oh, kind of turned, it turned purple and it was just kind of long of the short. 
the nerves in both um, the ulnar and the carpal nerves had been the, the, it collapsed. And so they had to go in and fix what they could. So my hand doesn't work as, my right hand doesn't work as well as my left hand, but it works just fine. But playing golf became painful because yeah, of sure scar tissue, yeah. flexion, that type of thing. So it was either not play golf or, you know, as I realized, like, well, we're going to just have to try this on the other side. <laughs> and that's what I did. I started over. I mean, I literally. So you got to see it as a beginner. Exactly. Exactly. Which um, I'm, I'm grateful for in many ways because I, I do believe that that has made me a much more empathetic and insightful teacher. Well, Limitations you, are real. I want to come back to that, but I sure. want to know what your other, probably one or two other major things for coaches. Mm -hmm. I'm sure. going to come back to your limitations here in a minute. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what would be the other one or two components about teachers that you'd want to see? Um, They're probably all related to the integration model, but. They are. Understanding, I realize we cannot spend tons of, time with with every individual but it is so important to to follow up to provide feedback to essentially just as we do with with our students in classrooms they need to know that you care that you are interested that this is not just about the paycheck that you really enjoy instruction because many instructors i mean i've you know heard and overheard conversations where many instructors talk very clearly they hate teaching, you know, so many we found over the years that many instructors had phenomenal golfers and had great aspirations. But as we well know, it is tough to make a living as a professional golfer, a tour, a tour player. Mm -hmm. Many, many fall short and many will fall into, into golf instruction, which can be a great place for them. They know, have a wealth of knowledge. They understand the game but not if you're not interested in instruction because your skill set as a player and skill set as a teacher are two different things. So if you're not in earnest interested in helping people learn, if that's not, if that's not a passion to you at some degree, I would invite some to consider participating in some other component of the industry. Yep. Because I think when, when, when we have teachers there who don't really care about teaching, or don't enjoy it. And sometimes I understand you don't realize that until you get into it, but it's doing a tremendous disservice to our, to our sport, to our industry. When you had to restart mm -hmm. and you, re I mean, I'm assuming when you joined from tennis, you were kind of starting as golf too and realized, Hey, I'm pretty good at this. And the growth curve was pretty fast. But when you switched over to the left side, I wouldn't think it was as fast. No. So I was the casual golfer. But you probably, because you were also a backhand, you could hit a backhand in tennis. Exactly. And which yes. is why I didn't play a lot of golf, but I could come I out and about I that. could still yep. shoot in the 80s. You're, yep. you, you nailed it, right? You, you understand? It's just a different plane. Exactly. So, right. I, to me, golf, I was like, the ball doesn't even really move. I mean, you know. <laughs> been in and How hard in. can it be? <laughs> right. You know, so, I mean, I wasn't the greatest, but I could, I could, I could go out and, and, and shoot in the 80s and have having having not played in some time or practice or anything like that. And you're exactly right. When I came to the other side of the ball, I remember vividly, I played around and a friend of mine, I called him to speak about it because he had recommended the course. I was away on, on, on vacation a little bit. And so he knew the area and I called him and he recommended a course. And then I called him back and I burst into tears and he said, what, what, what's going on? I said, I shot a 141. Oh, yeah. And I remember him going, he was like, that's, that's good, G. My first line, my first, that's, and I said, no, it's not. Stop lying. Stop lying. Mm -hmm. That is not good. But it is pretty good if you've never played golf before. Yeah, I couldn't imagine. That's even. what I had to understand. Yeah. But it's hard when you know you could shoot a 75. And yeah. You just went and shot an 80. But to literally, to, to, psychologically loose myself of the fact that I once had been a good golfer. I mean, I literally, I gave away every piece of equipment, right-handed equipment, which is what I had, gave it away. And I just had to set my mind right. And I remember I was visiting my parents. I grew up in Michigan and I, I went home and I was visiting my parents and my dad said, let's go to the golf store. And I'm thinking, because my, my parents play golf. I'm, you know, 
hey, sure, why not? Hanging out with that. And we go, and he's like, we're going to buy you a beginner set of golf clubs. And I was, you know, I'm going like, did he do? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. And I remember, you know, I had all the starter clubs. I had the seven iron that was like, you know, the, like the hybrid, you know, I mean, yeah. humbling. But it's, it's where I was. And so I embraced it. And... How did you, how did you move forward to get your doctorate? How did I move forward to get it? I mean, I know, but I mean, like, sure, sure, sure. I mean, it, it's like your, your Vita is a little unique. It is. It is. It's um, cool, but it's unique. So I love learning. And as my mother has always told me, whatever you are really interested in, Greta, you're going to end up teaching. You, sh you know, she said that for years and I just go, oh, mom, you know, but it's kind of true, whether it's statistics or golf or tennis, or, you know, I mean, if I'm, if I'm really, really interested in it, I, I probably will end up providing instruction. And so what I realized is that I need to understand instruction. And fortunately, I, I realized that pretty early on in life. So hmm. well, I still had the time I hadn't, you know, really worked. I was still used to living on a, a student pauper's budget. Mm -hmm. Um, I took the opportunity to to just pursue to, to pursue that and earn my my uh, PhD. Did you know you wanted? To, were you trying to teach golf? Were you trying to teach tennis? Or just I can oh, teach. Oh, absolutely anything. not. I was. I had every intention of teaching. Um, I was going to teach policy or uh, research classes. I'm a social scientist, and I love studying human behavior, which is one of the reasons being in golf, and because golf is a very social sport, but it's it's is full of behavior and these nuances and all of these different um, variables. It's just all kind of woven together very nicely, but it is a weird and kind of unique um, Vita, I, I guess at this point when I look at it, but it's all just kind of worked out. But at, at, at the essence, I love studying things and, and to identify the factors that we can influence to make things better. Damn, I like that. All right, I dig it. Yeah. I dig it. It, it, you know, the reason I say that is, is like, I, I think about like the, you know, I have a lot of my friends that are PGA instructors, mm -hmm. LPGA insp instructors, and I, I, I'm fascinated by how people like as a psychologist, you know, I are physicians, people, you know, primary care physicians treat about 60 to 70% of the mental health out there in this world mm -hmm. and, and get very little training on it. They, they learn on the fly. Right. We're working towards making that better. Uh, most coaches out there don't really have an understanding of the psychological side of sport. They may take one class, but it's really 80% of what they do. Golf instructors the same way. We, you know, we're doing more about motor learning, but do we know about the psychology or the social sciences behind it? Mm -hmm. You know, why is somebody upset and wonder, you know, what are the different factors? Mm -hmm. And, and I think it's great. Uh, do you, do you, I mean, come on, you got policy in your background. Are you involved in the policy and stuff of the LPGA in the, I know you're a class A LPGA instructor, but are you involved in those different levels? Yes. Okay. Yes. Really, that is what, um, apart from the, the learning and helping people learn even better and more efficiently, that is really one of the things, I guess I'd reached a season in, in my life where I, you know, it was kind of like, you can't wait for other people to do things. Where right? some things you're going to have to just jump in and do your do and participate in yourself. I can't do everything myself, but it just spoke to me. And hmm. that is really one of those things where I do, because I mean, frankly, many of those things is, you know, it's something, it's not about the paycheck. It is not about, you know, accolades and those types of things, but things need to be done with the hope and the faith that for the next generation or, you know, somewhere down the road, others won't even have to think about these issues. Yeah. And so that's my great hope. Where do you teach? Tell, tell our listeners where you teach out of in Atlanta. Sure, I teach out of Crystal Lake Golf and Country Club, which is in Hampton, just about 15 minutes south of the airport, directly down I-75. Gotcha. So and if you want to learn more about Greta, go to Dr. Greta Golf, G-R-E-T-A golf.com for more information. I want you to leave our listeners with kind of a charge and I got a pretty good understanding of what makes you tick and why you do it. But talk to the listeners out there, the parents of, of youth players, young girls or people new to the game and give them, give them a reason as to why to keep going in the game. Keep going in the game because there are many reasons. 
One, it's the, it's the game of a lifetime. You can play it from the time you're a little girl until you're a great grandma, God, God willing. Golf is a metaphor for life in so many ways. You know, every shot is its own entity, but when you put it together with all of those other shots, it cre creates the portrait of your life. But you can turn the corner from a bad moment to a great moment at any given instant. And that is one of the things about golf, right? You know, you, I hit a bad tee shot, but I can recover mm -hmm. if I set my mind to it. And that is, that is, that is life. We spend much of our life, we can, golf it can be a team sport, it's an individual sport. It fits everyone. So, you know, sometimes, you know, our, our particularly our girls, we have, you know, you know, I won't say self-esteem issues, but she's too, feels like she's feeling too tall, she's feeling too short, she's feeling too chunky, she's feeling too skinny, you know, she's not cute enough, you know. Golf, everyone can play golf. Yeah. And that is what I so love about it. You don't have to be able to run fast. You don't really have to be able to jump high. You don't have to have long arms. You don't have to have long legs. You can have long arms and you can have long legs, right? You don't have to have exemplary vision, like, you know, 2015 vision. You can come out in your glasses. It fits for everyone. And so what I find about golf is that it is, and I, and I have testimony from so many of, of the parents of the girls that I teach, that uh, this blossoming and self-awareness occurs when they realize that this isn't the easiest thing, but I can do this and I can do this with others. And I learned to cheer them on and they're supporting me. So it's a great environment. So stick with it. And I would also encourage you, it's a family sport. What other yes, sports can you play with? I play with my parents often. And it's one of the most fun things we do. My parents are in their seventies. It's a great thing. I, we can't play tennis together anymore. Yeah. But we can yeah. play golf. I always say, you know, bicycling and slash running, but I don't run sure. snow skiing and golf for the things you can do for a lifetime. Mm -hmm. And and okay. thank you for doing this podcast. It was, I wanted to, I did this podcast. I wanted to meet you. I wanted to have a chance to talk with you. So thank you so much. I enjoyed it. Thank you so much for doing this podcast. And to our listeners, make sure you check her out at drgretagolf.com and make sure you check out the mind side. If you like this podcast or like what we're doing, make sure you give us a review at the Apple iTunes store and make sure you give us five stars. If you like it, if you give us one star, just tell us why and what we can do to be better. And we promise we'll do our best until next time. This is Dr. Brett McKay, and I'll talk to you then. Uh -huh.